On March 4, 1829, Andrew Jackson took the oath of office as America's seventh president. As was customary at the time, the White House was open to the public following the inaugural ceremony. 15,000 ecstatic supporters flocked to Washington to celebrate, and it seemed like every last one of them showed up at the reception. They poured into the, into the rooms and they thought they would knock the walls down. They, there were so many of them, they were jammed in. Poor Jackson himself was almost uh, pinned against the wall and he had to be helped out of the building and, and to his hotel in order to save him. In his first message to Congress, Jackson unveiled the building blocks of what would become known as Jacksonian democracy, a government run by and dedicated to common men. He passionately went to work, setting nearly impossible goals. Abolish the electoral voting system. Relocate all Indians west of the Mississippi River. Extinguish the national debt. Eliminate the Bank of the United States, a private institution he determined to be corrupt. And do away with paper currency. Paper money is used to corrupt. They can inflate paper. You know, you go to a printing machine and you can turn it out. It's worthless, and you get people to accept it. But Jackson realized his agenda was too ambitious, that trying to both reform election law and abolish paper money would likely be futile. So he turned his attention to a fundamental constitutional dilemma that could endanger the Union itself, the issue of federal versus state authority. South Carolina was threatening to secede if forced to obey federal tariff laws. It was a position supported by Jackson's political foe, Henry Clay, as well as his own vice president, John Calhoun, a native of South Carolina. Jackson was ready for a fight to preserve the sovereignty of the Union. Jackson said, tell my friends in South Carolina that if any of them breathe a word of secession, I'm gonna come down there and I'm gonna hang them from the highest trees in the neighborhood. When Jackson talked that way, people paid attention. The South Carolinians decided, well, maybe we better reconsider. But if not for Jackson, the Union might well have fallen apart. With the issue of secession under control, Jackson turned his attention to a private institution he believed was corrupt, the Bank of the United States. Jackson had real reservations about the Bank of the United States on two grounds. One is he thought it was unconstitutional. Secondly, he believed that it gave too much power over the American economy to this group of private bankers who would have their own private interests rather than the interests of the country as a whole. The U.S. Bank controlled the flow of silver and gold upon which state banks based the value of their paper money. Jackson despised the bank's ability to alter its value at will. He called the bank's director, Nicholas Biddle, Tsar Nicholas, and the bank itself a monster needing to be chained. It was using its money for its own advantage. It was paying to have certain men elected, contributing towards their election, maintaining their position in Congress through their generous contributions. In theory, Biddle had nothing to worry about. The Supreme Court had ruled the bank constitutional, and its charter was not up for renewal until 1836, which would be the final year of Jackson's second term, if he ran and was re-elected. Henry Clay knew a big opportunity when he saw one. Teaming with Biddle, Clay convinced Congress to pass an early recharter bill that would endow the bank for an additional 12 years. With the 1832 election just months away, Clay and Biddle drew Jackson into a trap. They essentially dared Andrew Jackson to veto the recharter bill, thinking that Jackson wouldn't dare. The Bank of the United States was too essential to the economy, too essential to the business classes of the country. Well, they learned that Jackson wasn't somebody who lightly dared to do anything. Jackson knew vetoing the recharter could pose a risk to his reelection. The stress only worsened his longtime physical maladies. Late at night in his White House bedroom, he frequently bled himself using a small pocket knife. The procedure, believed to cleanse the body of toxins, 
was normally performed by a physician, but Jackson did it himself. He is also known to have read each evening from his deceased wife Rachel's personal prayer book while holding a miniature portrait bearing her likeness. The loss of Rachel and the rigors of the presidency, particularly the bank issue, were taking their toll on this seemingly indomitable personality. Nonetheless, Jackson decided to veto the recharter bill, thus making the future of the Bank of the United States the central issue of the 1832 presidential election. Jackson's opponent was none other than Henry Clay, who portrayed Jackson as King Andrew I, a despot trampling not just the National Bank, but the Constitution itself. Biddle and Henry Clay utterly misgaged how it was going to play. Jackson was able to say, I have defended the interests of the people. I have taken on the powerful commercial and financial interests. And he won. He won very handily in 1832, smacking down Biddle, smacking down Henry Clay. But Biddle, with four years remaining in the bank's current charter, struck back in a way many considered foolish. Biddle decides that he's going to teach Jackson a lesson. He's going to show him that a mere elected official, a mere president, shouldn't be dabbling in affairs that should be left to bankers who presumably knew what they were doing. To put pressure on Jackson, Biddle made life difficult for small businessmen, raising interest rates, refusing loan requests, and increasing foreclosures. When business owners appealed to Jackson for help, the president was blunt. Don't come to me, he said. Go to Biddle. He's the man with the money. Meanwhile, Jackson ordered the U.S. Treasury to move its silver and gold reserves from the U.S. Bank into state banks. To pull out the federal deposits was, in essence, to drive a stake through the heart of the Bank of the United States. Biddle thinks that because he controls the money, he has the trump card. But Jackson decides that this is a matter of principle. Democracy must rule. He pulled the deposits out, leaving the bank, leaving Biddle high and dry. Jackson could claim a great victory when the bank expired in 1836. Jackson, the uneducated commoner, was able to not only destroy the U.S. bank, but pay off the national debt, mainly by selling federal land. He has been the only American president in history to do so. Jackson believed that the federal government ought to live within its means just as an ordinary household did. And when he paid off the national debt, then he was able to go to bed that night with a great deal of satisfaction. Paying off the national debt was Jackson's proudest moment as president. 